I'm going to assume that you are in this class because you did not get a schedule and you don't know who's speaking in the other rooms, um, but you already made the mistake and you're in here, so you got to deal with it. Uh, but I'm glad that you're in here. Uh, whenever Tim called me and gave me the topic, uh, I, I got off the phone and my sweet, beautiful, wonderful wife uh, was nearby and she asked, who was that? And so I told her and told her what Tim wanted, and she said, oh, that's great. Uh, what's your topic? And I said, Zacchaeus. And she laughed. And she said, did they give you that because you're short? Um, so we're actually going to be talking about Goliath today, a uh, man of great stature, uh, much better, much more fitting. I, I so appreciate the theme of this conference, uh, of being here this weekend for affirming the faith and focusing our time on our mission and being a, a, sent, uh, a sent people. I, I love this seminar and others like it. Uh, they said this has been going for 16 years. My wife and I have been able to be a part of every one of those and have always enjoyed it uh, to be able to come and to see a lot of friendly faces, some that haven't got to see in a while. And it's, it's my hope and prayer that this isn't just a good weekend, but that it, it is what you need for you yourself as an individual, for a personal spark, for conviction, uh, for sharing your faith. As I look around the room that are in here today, some of you have known me for a really long time. I've got lifelong friends that are in the room. Um, my, my childhood preacher is in the room. My, my first youth minister is in the room. My campus minister is in the room. Uh, have you ever felt like a kid whose parents won't ever let them do anything on their own? Um, uh, great men who have influenced me and shaped me in so many ways. There are men uh, in this room from my first year in ministry, a uh, very special place in heaven for those people, and I'm thankful for their grace and their patience uh, throughout the year. Some of you, uh, this is our first introduction. There really isn't anything special about me. Here's what I want you to know about me. I consider myself to be among the most fortunate people on planet Earth, because I was born into a home who loved Jesus, that, that I had a father and a mother who, who taught me to love Jesus, grew up in a strong uh, church family that influenced me and shaped me in ways that I'm still learning about. Um, basically, I was born singing uh, 728B and, <laughs> and skipping the third verse of every song. Um, <clears throat> I, I decided very young that I wanted to preach and started pursuing that from about um, early high school years that I wanted to preach, and now I'm in my 16th year of ministry. Uh, I've never known a time in my life without the church. I, I say that because I want you to know I deeply, passionately love the church. I love you. You people are so weird. Um, you, you've given up a weekend to come to something like this. You're different. And, and I love you. You're my people. You're my friends, you're my family. And, and I wanted to begin that way today because with your permission, I want to talk to you today like you're my family. Uh, I, I hope that I can say some things that are encouraging, maybe share something new with you from the text that we're going to be looking at today. But really the heart of what I want to do is I want to challenge you because I, I've been challenged in the study that we're going to be looking at today. As you turn our attention to Luke chapter 19, the topic that I've been assigned it's this beautiful story that most of you, if you're like me, you first learned it from a very young age in, in Bible class, probably accompanied a song as you're learning about a wee little man in a sycamore tree. The danger, and those of you that have been around for a while, you know this, the danger in allowing some accounts, some stories to become so familiar to us is that we fail to examine them again with a fresh set of eyes. That, that we fail to allow those stories, those accounts, to penetrate our hearts and to transform us into the image of Jesus. And I, I want to ask you to, to do that with me today because I'm convinced that the aim that Luke had in, in writing about this tax collector uh, was so much more important than impressing on his readers the vertical challenges of a man. That, that what he had in mind is something that I think many of us would probably be uncomfortable to admit how much we need this story, uh, how much we can learn from this story. And I'm convinced 
uh, that it can, it can shape the way that we view a lot of things if we look at it again with a fresh set of eyes. And so as we begin, I want us to think about something that we do know to be true about Zacchaeus. Uh, starting here in Luke uh, chapter 19 and in verse 3, we know something was true about Zacchaeus is that he was somebody who was seeking to find out who Jesus was. Well, we don't know what Zacchaeus had heard. We just know he'd heard about this Jesus of Nazareth. He had heard about some of his teachings, likely. Maybe some of the things that Jesus had said that, that, that sounded too, be, too good to be true, or maybe some of the things that sounded a little controversial that they had reached the ears of Zacchaeus. Maybe he had heard about the miracles that Jesus was able to work. Something sparked an interest. And so as Jesus was passing through, Jesus, uh, Zacchaeus wanted to make sure that he could find who this Jesus was. The reason why I want us to focus on that is because often whenever we come to Luke 19, we, we can do what we've been doing throughout this weekend, and we quickly turn our attention to Jesus' mission statement, right? The, the famous statement at the end of this account where Jesus speaks about why he came to this earth. The Son of Man came to what? to seek and save that which was lost, right? That was his mission. If that's his mission, that should be our mission. And we focus on that, and we should always focus on that. But I want us to understand this today, that Jesus wasn't the only one seeking that day. That there was somebody else who was looking for him and wanted to know who he was and come to know him just a little bit deeper. And so for our time today, I want us to begin by focusing uh, simply on the fact that in our world, in our families, in our churches, in our communities, in our places of work, we still have people that are climbing trees. We still have people that live among us who are trying to find out who is Jesus. They've heard some stuff. They've seen some stuff. And a lot of the things that they've heard and a lot of things that they've seen really isn't that good. But they want to know who is Jesus. There's a, um, a common narrative amongst a lot of Christians, a lot of our people. And, and that narrative usually goes something like this. The world out there, they're terrible. They, they don't know God, they don't care about God, and they don't care about the truth. Can I tell you today, I, I don't believe that. Now, I think that that's true for some, but as a general rule... I think that's a work of Satan, that, that Satan wants nothing more than to convince you that you cannot make a difference because the people out there aren't interested anyways. That's what Satan wants you to believe. Don't let him convince you of that. I, I've got a few things that I want to share with you, some recent things to hopefully encourage your heart just a little bit, to tell you what I'm talking about, about the fact that we still have people that are climbing trees. Um, as I mentioned, or as was mentioned, I preached for the Northwest Church in Lawton, Oklahoma. Been there since 2012. And do uh, you guys ever have any visitors that come to your services? Um, <clears throat> if you work for a church or have spent any time, if it's ever been your responsibility to try to get the information from visitors and to welcome them and maybe to get them to fill out a card, you know that's, that's kind of like pulling teeth, right? To, to get somebody to give you their, their information and Oftentimes people come in and they want to come in and they want to leave and they really don't want to connect and they really don't want to give you that information. Uh, we do everything that we can uh, to try to get people to fill out a card. We'll give them a gift if they'll do that for us. We, we bribe them. We're not above that. You know, we, we, we want to know who these people are. And I, I was just looking this last week and just in this last year in 2023, we had over 75 uh, people who live in Lawton who came to our services and filled out a card, they came to us first, 75, in one year that we did nothing for. Like, we didn't, we didn't invite them. We weren't the ones who went out and was seeking them and saying, you know, you need to come. They came to us, 75-plus people that filled out a card. Now, you do the math on figuring out how many would have come in total. And I would imagine the same is probably true wherever you're at, that you have people that show up at your door probably on a weekly basis because they're interested in something. They're, they're looking for Jesus. They're looking for a place to belong. They're looking for a community, as some of our speakers have already talked about uh, this weekend. 
uh, perhaps they've seen your advertisements on social media or a friend invited them or they just drove by your building. They came for some reason. There are people in your community who are looking for Jesus. And I hope that you know that and understand that. We have a ministry that is very special at Northwest to the hearts of a lot of our members. And it's something that's gone on for years, and it's very successful, and I have nothing to do with it. And that's a big part of why it's successful. Is um, we, we have a group of volunteers that go out to Fort Sill, just north of Lawton, and they host a worship service for the basic trainees that come, and they're not allowed to leave the base. And that's been going on for years. And in a very simple way to begin their service, they'll share the gospel message and and then they'll go into a service and they'll take the Lord's Supper and they'll sing songs and all the stuff that you would do on a Sunday, they do out there with these basic trainees. And through the years, we've seen a lot of those soldiers come through and express a desire to obey the gospel and, and to keep coming throughout their training. It's a wonderful thing. But a couple of weeks ago, one of our elders stood up uh, who goes out there every Sunday and helps with that work. And he shared a story that just struck me because he, he wanted the congregation to know something that happened that day, that they were having their, their regular service and how it's broken up is they have a couple of rooms or too big for one room. And there was a drill sergeant who had brought the troops down and he was kind of there to keep things in order and he wasn't part of the service, but he was kind of bouncing between the two rooms and he hung around and he listened to what was being said. And whenever the service was over and everybody left, he came to our members and he asked to be baptized into Christ. He wasn't even the target. He was the Lord's target. We have preachers that are in the room today and preachers, I hope that you never forget that it's the Lord who works through your preaching. We have no idea what he's going to do with it. Just be faithful to it and keep preaching. That there are people that we aren't even thinking about. That whenever they hear the message of Jesus, they say, I want to be a part of that. That's still happening today. A couple of months ago, I'm in my office on a Thursday afternoon trying to finalize uh, my thoughts for Sunday and get some things wrapped up. And I hear a knock on the door. I was the only one at the building. And I go to answer the door and I see a man outside that I don't recognize, and um, I'm ashamed to say, but we're family, so I'll tell you the truth. I, I assumed some things about him. And, and if you work in the church, you've probably have been there, where there's somebody who shows up, you don't know them, you don't know why they're there, and often they're looking for some kind of financial assistance, and sometimes you can help them, sometimes you can't. Most of the time, you'll never see them again. And, and I assumed that's what was happening, and so I go and I open the door and I say, can I help you? was something in this man who looked like he was going through some stuff. And he, with tears in his eyes, he just said, I just want to know, is there anybody here who can talk to me about becoming a Christian? So I said, no, we don't do that here. You can go down there. Um, I invite him in, uh, set him down in my office, and I start talking to him, asking me, you know, what brings you to us today? And he starts telling me about addictions that he's been fighting and things that he's been struggling with and that he's been praying and he's been asking, uh, asking God for help. And he worked at Walmart right across the street and he kept seeing our church building and he said, you know what, I'm going to go over there and see if some, somebody there can help me. And, and I talked with him and was able to baptize him into Christ. And guess who walked to our services the very next Sunday and was right there bright and early. You know, I share that story and I hope that you understand I didn't do anything. The, the Lord brought somebody to my door who was ready to obey the gospel. Church, I want you to know that there are people everywhere who are looking for Jesus. And, and if you feel like that's not true, I want to encourage you to pray that God open your eyes again. Because people in your community are searching for Jesus. So that brings up a question. If the community in which you live and work, if they're looking for Jesus and we're Jesus people, we want to share that message, we want to make sure people know about him, then why haven't our churches just exploded? Why aren't we just bursting at the seams? Well, there are sometimes some obstacles that get in the way. And that's where I want us to really drill down on our text for today. You know, if somebody were to ask you just a generic question... 
What is it that hinders people from coming to Jesus? I wonder how you would respond to that question. I'll tell you that without putting a lot of thought into it, it, whenever I ask myself that question, some of the thoughts that came to my mind immediately are some of the ones we've already addressed. You know that people don't really care about the truth. Um, as, uh, as some of our speakers have pointed out, it's not so much that people are antagonistic, just they just don't, they don't care. They don't care one way or another. Maybe I might think about atheistic leanings. They've been taught, they've been raised in a society or by a family that they don't believe in Jesus, so why would they, why would they come to Jesus if they don't believe he's real? Um, and maybe we think, well, they're just too consumed with themselves. I'm glad that's a problem of the world, not of the church, right? Um, <clears throat> we can have all of these reasons in our mind of what might keep somebody from coming to Jesus. And I think those obstacles are very real and many others. But I want to ask for your attention today as we turn our attention to what Luke records for us in um, not just Luke 19. We're going to spend time there, but we're also going to go back a little bit because I want you to see how Luke tells the story because what Luke does is he highlights some unlikely obstacles that keep people from coming to Jesus. And this is going to be the challenging part for us today. As we turn our attention back there to Luke chapter 19 and verse 3, I want you to notice how Luke writes these words. That, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but notice your Bible. On account of the crowd, he could not. Now, we know the text goes on to talk about how Zacchaeus was a wee little man, right? He was short in stature, and so he couldn't see. But as somebody who can just barely relate to Zacchaeus, let me tell you something. I like to go to the movies with my family and get my overpriced popcorn and enjoy whatever movie's coming out that I'm excited about. And it's a real science uh, to pick the best seat in the theater, right? You can't be too close. You can't be too far. You, you don't want the speakers to make your ears bleed, but you want to be able to feel the rumble of the theme. So you find just the perfect spot. And, and I will sit there and I can see the screen, no problem, until some professional basketball player He's like five foot ten or something. He comes and, and sits down in front of me, and now my experience is ruined. I want you to understand that Zacchaeus' height wasn't the reason that he couldn't see Jesus. It, it was the people who were around Jesus that made it so that Zacchaeus couldn't see. And, and as we're thinking this weekend about our mission of being a sent people. Church, I can't help but wonder how often we are the ones getting in someone's way of seeing who Jesus really is. We can be a judgy people, can we not? We like to judge books by their cover uh, in, in a lot of ways. You made a lot of judgments today about which classes you're going to go to. You know, I, I like this speaker. I like this topic. I like this pew. Uh, the class I wanted to go to was full, so I had to come to this one. Uh, this is the one where the donuts are at, right? You're my people. I know how you think. Well, we make judgments a lot, uh, some that really have no consequence, some that have major consequences. But what I want us to see that Luke points out is that often we do a lousy job of seeing what it is that God sees. And the more that I look at the story of this wee little man, the more I wonder whether or not that is the point that we're supposed to take away from the text. You might be interested to know that uh, the story of Zacchaeus, as well known as it is, it's only recorded in Luke's gospel. Uh, it's not found in the other gospel accounts. And there's a lot of theories as to why that is. And we could talk about that and never get the answer. But rather than do that, what I want to do is I want us to pay careful attention to how Luke shares this story because it's unique to his gospel. So how does he tell it? Uh, how does it fit with what else he's been writing? What, what's the bigger picture here of what Luke is doing with the story of this wee little man? And so if you've got your Bibles and you want to go backwards, we won't read them all, but I'll give you the references. I want you to go back uh, to Luke 18. And, and as we look at Luke 18 and we begin uh, kind of our brief survey of setting the context here, uh, in verse 9 through 14, and Jesus is telling a story. And he's, he's telling a parable. And this is a parable that you, we know well of a Pharisee and a man who has a certain profession. 
a tax collector. And you remember this story. The Pharisee, he's a, um, he's a good church-going guy. And, and he, he loves the sound of his own voice. And, and he loves to pray. And his prayers sounded really, really weird, if you read them. God, thank you for making me so good. You ever prayed that prayer? Hope not. God, thank you for making me so good. Look at all of the great things that I've done in my life. God, I tithe and I fast, and, and I'm nothing like that guy. I'm nothing like that tax collector over there. And God, thank you for making me so much better. My life would be miserable if I was like him. And then Jesus turns his attention to that tax collector and how that tax collector's prayer was so different from that of the Pharisee that he had a much better understanding of who he was than the Pharisee had of who he was. And in the tax collector's prayer, as he couldn't lift his eyes up to heaven, and all he could say was, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Remember how Jesus ends that parable by saying it's it's that tax collector, not the good church-going guy. It's that tax collector who's going to go home justified. I want you to pay special attention to verse 9 if you have your Bible open and understand why Jesus told this parable. You know, sometimes as we read through these accounts, especially the well-known and familiar, we can kind of think, well, Jesus just liked to tell stories, but he told stories for a reason. Why did he have this parable? There was a problem going on in the hearts of men, and the problem was there were so many who were trusting in themselves trusting in their own righteousness. And as a result of trusting in what they have done, trusting in themselves, trusting in their righteousness, it began to change the way they treated